Mishra. I welcome you all, all the delegates and postgraduates for 21st academic webinar. And also I welcome all the office bearers and academic advisors of ISA Karnataka. Today we have with us Dr. Shushidhar from NHS Foundation, who will be talking on perioperative management uh, of uh, patients on anticoagulants. Welcome you, sir. And Dr. Suresh Rao, well-known cardiac anesthesiologist from Chennai, is an alumni of uh, WIMS uh, Ballari, who will be speaking on uh, ECMO in a transplant scenario. Welcome you, sir. We also have uh, uh, Dr. S.B. Gangadhar, Professor and Anesthesiology at Sri Siddhartha Medical College, Tumkur, who will be contesting for ISA National President-elect 2022 to be held during first week of November. And Dr. Vijayanand, the past president of ISA Karnataka and professor at uh, Kempegowda Institute of Medical Science, Bengaluru, will be contesting for, uh, for the post of I ISA National GC member. I request all of you to support uh, candidature of Dr. Vijayanand and Dr. Uh, Gangadhar. The first session will be moderated by uh, Dr. Bala Baskar, past uh, president of ISA National and past editor IHA, IJA. Uh, and the uh, so second uh, session will be moderated by Dr. S.P. Gangadhar. Um, uh, over to Dr. Balbaskar, sir. Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shukumar, the President, uh, Dr. Manjunath. Yes, sir. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Gurudath, Academic Committee Coordinator here along with uh, Dr. Asnam. And happy to be here also because Dr. Sheshdari is here. So I've got uh, very good academicians. Uh, and uh, Dr. Suresh. Have, yes, yeah. Dr. Uh, Suresh. I have a meeting at 7.30. OK, thank so you. Please. Is, yeah. 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 You can please go ahead. Thank you. No, no, sorry. Uh, not that. No, not that. Uh, uh, Shashi, I'm, no, I'm, yours, yours will be the first, sir. Yours will be the first. Only. OK, then we will be the first. No, no. Ah, yours is first. <laughs> so I'm happy for you to go first. Don't worry, my meeting is at four o'clock. Uh -huh. So I got some time. So, so because I, um, uh, Dr. Suresh was also my MBBS mathematics in Ballari, and uh, he's also well known in our group. Our alumni is also a big one, big gang, gang of uh, people who are reached, uh, you know, uh, zenith in their careers. So many people are there, and uh, we have uh, probably. Uh, I will call it a, call him as a transplant specialist or LVAD specialist or now ECMO specialist. Too many things are there. Ascribe to him. Uh, thank you for accepting to participate. Um, uh, thank you. You can please go ahead. Okay. Uh, can I share my screen? Okay. Yeah. Good evening, all. First of all, uh, thank you, Balavaskar, for the kind introduction. And also, I thank uh, uh, academic chairman, Dr. Vijayanand, and advisors, uh, Dr. Gurudath, Dr. Gangadhar, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Azam. And also, ISA, I mean, ISA Karnataka chapter president, Dr. Manjunath, Dr. Nazir, and Dr. Shivkumar. Dr. Shimukumar was the one who was uh, contacting me, and also Dr. Sudesh, and uh, Dr. Anil, also editor of uh, KSA, or, yeah. So, uh, I'll be speaking about the ECMO, uh, because ECMO has uh, wider applications. Uh, this is in the transplant scenario. It is used either as bridge to transplant or it is used as a bridge to recovery in the post-transplant period. So that is MGM Healthcare where uh, our Institute of Heart and Lung Transplant and Mechanical Circulatory Support provide various services like uh, trans heart transplant, lung transplant, and uh, LVADs. So to begin with, what is ECMO? ECMO basically uh, is extracorporeal oxygenation. 
uh, there are two types, VA ECMO and VV ECMO. In VA ECMO, the deoxygenated blood is drained from the venous system and after oxygenation, it is given back to the arterial system. So it will bypass the heart and the lungs. Whereas in, basically this is used in heart failure situations. Whereas venous ECMO, you drain the blood from the venous compartment and after oxygenation, you'll give it back to the uh, right atrium. So there are two types, either you can use uh, two cannulae where one will be the drainage cannula, other will, will be the, the written cannula. Now these are the various uh, uh, ESLS uh, technologies. VV ECMO basically provides oxygenation and removes the carbon dioxide, but doesn't provide circulatory support. Whereas peripheral VA ECMO, it oxygenates the peripheral organs, may not be oxygenate the central organs because if the blood is flowing through a lung, which is diseased, it may not be oxygenated. And that blood is pumped by the left ventricle into the proximal aorta, which will supply to the coronaries and the brain. So central organs may not get oxygen if it is peripheral VA ECMO. It does remove the carbon dioxide and also it does uh, provide circulatory support. Central VA ECMO, uh, it uh, oxygenates the central organs also, removes the carbon dioxide and also supports the circulation. Then there is extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal, which doesn't support oxygenation, but it removes only carbon dioxide. Then we have peripheral nova lung. Here, you don't need any ECMO machine, two cannula, one into the femoral artery and one into the femoral vein. The arterial pressure drives the blood. So this is basically used for removing the carbon dioxide. It will not provide oxygenation. And we also have a long duration uh, uh, artificial lung where there is a cannula into the pulmonary artery and the nova lung is the gas exchange uh, oxygenator and the oxygenated blood is given back to the left atrium. So this is used as a long-term uh, chronic lung failure, uh, uh, I mean, uh, patients, it supports the lungs. Coming to our own experience, we would have done around 500 uh, heart, uh, thoracic organ transplant, out of which uh, 400 are uh, heart transplants, around 100 lung transplants. We have done around uh, 480 ECMOs. Uh, half of them are uh, VA ECMO, half are uh, VV ECMO, and also LVADs, that is both uh, long duration LVAD and short duration LVADs, around 72. So first, let me talk about the technique of cannulation. So in Veno Venus ECMO, I said we use two cannulae, one cannula into the femoral vein, which drains the IVC blood, and the oxygenated blood is given back to the SVC through the cannula in the IJV. And uh, this can be done with percutaneous technique or open surgical methods. But in our unit, we use uh, only percutaneous technique. In most of the centers, now they are doing percutaneous ECMO. Uh, neuroscopy is not required. Usually at the end of the procedure, we take one chest X-ray. So we know the cannula positions. Transesophageal echo, yes, it is useful. But uh, during COVID time, uh, we were avoided using transesophageal echo. Uh, this is uh, to demonstrate cannulation. This is the femoral vein. First, you puncture the femoral vein, then put the guide wire, then use uh, series of uh, dilators. Uh, then use a bigger size dilator. Once this dilator is in, you can put the, insert the cannula. Just like inserting your uh, triple one tube. So this cannula usually freely goes. It has got side ports also. So distal port drains the blood from the right atrium. The side ports drain the blood from the IVC. And usually this is done by us. I used to do all the cases. Then now our intensive care unit team is doing. So we have somebody who can put the patient on ECMO all the times, 24 hours into seven. 
same time you can puncture the ijv use the same technique this is for vv ecmo if it is veno arterial ecmo we puncture the femoral artery and insert the same cannula uh, you can also use uh, single lumen which will have two i mean single cannula with two lumens uh, it will have three ports one two ports drain from the venous blood from the svc and ivc through a single lumen and the other lumen the oxygenated blood is given back to the right atrium so management of ecmo once a patient is put on ecmo ventilatory management is important usually we go for rest ventilatory settings you do need not ventilate the lungs fully we just keep some optimal peep and a few six uh, breath rate will be six we have to see that the plateau pressure is not high usually keep it uh, around 15 and fio2 should not be more than 50 we keep it uh, 40% and second thing is uh, ecmo flow depends upon the oxygen saturation our idea is to keep the saturation around 85 to 90 uh, with veno venous ECMO. And we give a ECMO flow of around 60 to 70 percent of the cardiac output. Sometimes we may not be able to give good ECMO flow, in which case uh, we fill the patient, get the CVP to 10. If the drainage is still bad, we'll put one more cannula into the femoral vein. And in spite of all these things, if the oxygen saturation is low, we will transfuse blood, we'll increase the hemoglobin so that the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is increased. Sometimes these patients may have severe pulmonary artery hypertension. So in which case we use uh, inhaled pulmonary vasodilators, which helps in improved uh, pulmonary circulation. Now, one of the problem with the ECMO is recirculation. That means the venous blood is drained. This happens in veno venous ECMO. The oxygenated blood will come back to the right atrium. Same blood is drained through the venous cannula. Or if you are using a single cannula with two lumens, the placement of this one should be important. If the RA port is in the IVC or SVC, again, there will be recirculation. So how will you manage? The distance between the two cannulae should be at least eight centimeter. If it is closer, the chances of recirculation are more. Anticoagulation, usually we use heparin and maintain a ACT of around 200, APTT of two times the control. But in during COVID season, we found patients were in a hypercoagulable state. So we maintained the APTT around 2.5 times the normal. And we found that anti-10SA is very useful while managing this anticoagulation. Weaning, so yeah, once the lung complaints is getting better, tidal volumes are getting better, oxygenation is getting better, probably the patients are ready for weaning VV ECMO. So usually we reduce the FIO2 on the uh, sweep gas flow. That means the oxygenator, the ECMO oxygenator will get oxygen supply. So we'll try to reduce that. And finally, we'll switch off oxygen. So the blood will be going through the ECMO machine without oxygenation. So if the patient tolerates for 24 hours, we'll take out the uh, VV ECMO. Now coming to the ECMO in heart transplant situations, uh, we are using ECMO as a bridge to heart transplant. Some of the patients in end stage heart failure who require transplant, they may not get the heart uh, immediately. So in the waiting period, a lot of patients will have severe decompensation and we lose them also. In such situations, sometimes we will put them on uh, VA ECMO. Uh, I'll just present one case. This particular boy had severe heart failure. He got admitted for a heart transplant. But meanwhile, uh, he had near cardiac arrest. So we were there, we kept massaging got back the heart, then we put him on VA ECMO. So he was on VA ECMO for almost uh, uh, two weeks. Then we got a heart, then we did the heart transplant. You can see the ECMO cannula in the chest. It was a central ECMO, which was done surgically. And this is after the transplant, 
In fact, uh, yeah. he walked home. In the immediate period, he had stroke. That's why he is limping between his legs. But finally, he went home, and uh, now he has become a bodybuilder. It is. Uh, this is another child who was in Jitmar, uh, had severe heart failure. So we put, put him on ECMO. Uh, usually we excavate them. They'll be on ECMO till they get a heart. And finally he got the heart transplant done. And uh, finally we could discharge him home. This is another girl who uh, had severe heart failure. We put her on ECMO. We were mobilizing daily. And uh, daily she was asking us when I'm getting the heart. So one day we said the heart is ready. She had all the smiles. And finally, this is in the post-transplant period. Uh, she, in fact, uh, she gained a lot of weight in the, after one month. So ECMO can be used as a short-term mechanical circulatory support. Whether it is acute decompensation of the chronic heart failure or some patients may have Severe intractable arrhythmias. You may not be able to control with uh, uh, drugs. And in such situations, if they are really hemodynamically bad, you can put them on ECMO as a mechanical circulatory support. And other thing is eCPR. We have done around uh, almost 40 eCPR. That means the patient who had a cardiac arrest, witnessed cardiac arrest, if we can't get back the heart, we'll put them on veno arterial ECMO. So, the circulation is maintained and some of the patients, the heart has recovered, especially the underlying cause for cardiac arrest is reversible. And most of our patients were heart failure patients. We, we know that heart will not recover. So those patients, it was used as a bridge to transplant. So finally, we did the heart transplant and uh, could send them home, majority of them. So usually when the patient with heart failure uh, we prefer to put them on LVAD as a bridge to transplant. But some patients you will not be able to use LVAD, especially if the patient had severe left ventricular hypertrophy or if there is severe biventricular fa failure because LVAD will take care of only the left ventricle. So if there is a severe right ventricular dysfunction, we cannot use LVAD. So ECMO is the other choice. And uh, congenital heart disease and uh, refractory ventricular arrhythmias the LVAD will not work. Uh, this is this article from uh, Circulation where they looked at the ECMO used as a bridge to heart transplantation. They looked at various complications. Yeah, they do happen because of the device malfunction or some stroke, neurological events, bleeding, infection, renal dysfunction, hepatic dysfunction. So all these the device thrombus, thrombus, all those things can happen. And also there is a mortality in the waiting list. Uh, some patients we may lose during the ECMO because of the various complications. Some patients uh, die while waiting for the heart transplantation. And some patients we may lose even in the post-transplant period, immediate post-transplant period, because these are all very high risk patients and they would have died out but for the transplant. So, but overall one year survival uh, in patients who are an ECMO, and if you do a transplant, survival is around 52%. But if they are not on ECMO, survival may be 75%. This is much lesser, I mean, lower values because I think this uh, article was published in 2015. But now we get almost 90% uh, survival uh, in the heart transplantation patient. If they are an ECMO, the survival probably around 70, 70 to 80 percent. Um, and usually the mortality is in the first six months. But if, you, if they are alive after six months, then whether we use the ECMO or not use the ECMO, it will not uh, be, it will not matter. So they, they do very well in the post transplant period. <clears throat> now, coming to the ECMO in the post heart transplant period. So, so far I was discussing about the uh, use of ECMO as a bridge to transplant in heart failure patients. Now you do a transplant, suddenly the heart cannot uh, function. There may be graft failure after the transplant. And uh, sometimes you can have severe rejection uh, for various reasons. So then also you can use ECMO. So I will just give one case scenario. We had a two-year-old baby 
dilated cardiomyopathy, severe pulmonary hypertension. And uh, finally, we did the orthotopic uh, transplant, but she developed, I mean, that child developed severe right ventricular dysfunction. This is because child had severe pulmonary artery hypertension. So you can look at the echo. This is the left ventricle functioning very well, but right ventricle is dilated. In fact, this heart, uh, we took it from Bangalore, seven years. So we put the child on ECMO, then right ventricle fully recovered and we could take off the ECMO. And uh, this is the baby who had the, had uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, then uh, transplant, then on ECMO, then finally recovered and went home. It was seven years back, then that boy has grown up and is uh, going to the school. This is another case scenario, a 54 year old dilated a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy, high uh, pulmonary hypertension, high pulmonary artery pressure, again developed severe uh, right ventricular dysfunction. So we put, it, put him on ECMO. Uh, this is on ECMO. LV is good, but the right ventricle is severely dilated. Ideally, the right ventricular size should be less than the left ventricular size. So he was on ECMO for almost uh, seven days. We extubated him. So we continued the ECMO for a week. Then the right ventricular function improved. So we, here you can see the right ventricle. It is contracting well. On day 14, we could uh, take off the ECMO and uh, send him home. So basically ECMO used as a rescue strategy. So sometimes uh, primary graft dysfunction can happen because of the long ischemic time, especially we take a heart from Chandigarh also. So obviously it takes time for the heart to come here. Or sometimes we accept uh, do uh, heart from a donor who is uh, aged maybe 50 years, 60 years, 70 years also. Or sometimes uh, the myocardial uh, preservation may not be good. And uh, for various reason, reasons, we can have primary graft dysfunction. So it is a useful strategy. These are the various publications where they looked at the outcome. If the ECMO is used as a uh, uh, rescue measure in the post-transplant situations, and the long-term long outlook looks very good, 100% in one case, 93, 94. In most of the cases, uh, the uh, results are very good. And uh, only thing, these patients will be on ECMO hardly four to eight days uh, in the immediate post-transplant period. And uh, sometimes we use, use uh, peripheral uh, cannulation, sometimes central. But overall, uh, they do well because the heart recovers. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, looking at the survivor. Uh, long-term survival is uh, rate is around 90%. Now, next thing is to talk about the ECMO in uh, uh, lung failure patients. It is both again used as a bridge to transplant in patients with uh, severe uh, lung failure, or sometimes it is used as a rescue therapy. That means post lung transplant, if there is primary graft dysfunction, again, we may use uh, ECMO. So I will just present one interesting case, a 46 year old adult. He's a automobile engineer from Ukraine. In fact, we did it uh, five years back. He had a severe ILD. He visited Germany, so many other places. So they said uh, uh, very high risk uh, transplant. So they were refused him. So, and uh, he was in a hospital, some other hospital bedridden he came to us with the severe respiratory failure. We put him on ventilator. This is the chest X-ray and his saturations in spite of 100% uh, oxygen, uh, saturations were around 70s. So we didn't have any other way but to put him on ECMO. So we used the Avalon cannula. This is the single cannula with two lumens. One lumen will drain the venous blood and the other lumen will uh, return the oxygenated blood back to the right atrium. So he was on uh, VV ECMO for almost a month's time. Then finally, we got a lung. We did the lung transplant. Then finally, he was on tracheostomy. Uh, so we are doing a lot of physiotherapy.
therapy. This is the chest X-ray in the post uh, lung transplant period. And uh, this is uh, a recently taken uh, photo in the Facebook. Uh, he is roaming around uh, in Ukraine, in spite of Ukraine, he is undergoing a, a turbulent time. So there is a role for a, using ECMO as a bridge to lung transplant because the need for donor organs exceeds the availability and uh, around five to 10% of the patients will die while waiting for a lung transplant. So this is an alternative method of uh, uh, maintaining the uh, lung failure, uh, respiratory failure patients till they get a lung. Uh, looking at the history of ECMO, in fact, the first ECMO was uh, instituted in uh, 1972. However, in 1980 to 2000, not much things happened because the mortality was very high. But after 2006, uh, ECMO found various applications and present day we are using ECMO extensively as a bridge to transplant and also as a bridge to recovery, both in heart and lung uh, failure patients. If you look at the data, after 2010, the usage of ECMO has uh, steeply increased because this is because of the good outcomes. So what are the indications to put a patient on ECMO in patients with respiratory failure? If they have severe refractory hypoxemia, the PF ratio less than 150 with the FiO2 of 90 and the plateau pressure more than 30. Or if the PCO2 is above 80 millimeter of mercury and uh, pH is less than 7.1, then those are the indications for ECMO. Usually we use uh, uh, various criteria. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, indications. Now, what are the contraindications? Now, if the patient has got malignancy, it is a contraindication. And again, multi-organ failure, if they have severe uh, uh, CNS uh, injury during cardiac arrest or before the institution of ECMO or if they have cerebral hemorrhage, all these conditions are contraindications. Uh, there are relative contraindications, advanced age, uh, even though beyond 65, it is a contraindication. We have put a patient who was 80 year old who had a severe uh, COVID-19 ARDS. We put him on ECMO. He was on ECMO for 20, 20 days and we could wean off the ECMO and he has gone back to his uh, work. In fact, he's a very VAP and uh, he's back to his work. And uh, obesity, again, relative contraindication. Now, there are some favorable factors to have a good outcome after the ECMO. If the age is less than 50 years and the duration of ECMO less than 14 days and the low SOFA score, patient is on only non-invasive ventilation, not our ventilatory support. So then the outcome will be better. But if it is beyond 60 years, if the bilirubin is more than three and it's prolonged ECMO more than 14 days, SOFA score more than nine major bleeding infections. So in all these cases, the outcomes are not, uh, not so good. Uh, these are the various uh, papers, studies, where they looked at the one-year survival after lung transplant in patients who were on ECMO before the transplant. And they had a, a decent outcome around uh, 50 to 93 percent of the patients recovered after the uh, lung transplant. This is another uh, study looked at the outcome. These are the various uh, demographic data. And if you look at the kaplan meier curve, the control and the patients who were put, uh, put on ECMO then did the lung transplant, the outcome is almost uh, similar. So in fact, uh, if the patient is on ventilator, the outcome is uh, worse. And if the patient is on ECMO without ventilator, the outcome is better. Uh, this is because uh, we have uh, newer technology. The ECMO oxygenators are uh, having very low resistance and uh, we need uh, 
high durability centrifugal pumps which causes less trauma to the blood vessels blood and also heparin coated uh, tubings so improved uh, cannulation strategies all these have resulted in better outcome uh, with the ecmo now the finally the ecmo as a rescue therapy in the post lung transplant patients sometimes we may have a situation you have done the lung transplant and uh, you cannot come off by pulse because the lungs are not uh, oxygenating the patient well i'll just start with the case scenario we had a 28 year old female uh, she had the severe pulmonary artery hypertension she was getting worse and finally came to us with the severe breathlessness and uh, pain in the abdomen and uh, uh, she can't walk she can't lie down uh, we did the echo because of, this is the right ventricle because of the pulmonary artery hypertension patient developed severe right ventricular dysfunction also then finally we did the lung transplant but in the post lung transplant period patient developed uh, severe heart failure also and primary graft dysfunction also so we put the patient after the bilateral lung transplant we put the patient on va ecmo then we were maintaining for va ecmo the heart recovered then we converted va va ecmo into vva ecmo vva ecmo means there is a venous drainage from the ivc and the oxygenated blood is given back to femoral artery to the arterial system and also to the right atrium which goes through the pulmonary circulation and we will go back to the systemic circulation and finally we converted it into vv ecmo and finally we could take off the vv ecmo and send her home this is her photograph when she came for a uh, review after the uh, lung heart, lung transplant so one of the commonest indication for ecmo in the post lung transplantation is primary graft dysfunction and the indication is uh, pf ratio less than 150 and uh, uh, the x ray shows severe infiltrates and it is always better to institute ecmo within 72 hours otherwise the mortality will be high so again it is done usually within 48 to 72 hours uh, outcomes again in the post transplant lung transplant period if you put ecmo the mortality is 44% whereas if they don't need ecmo after the lung transplant mortality is around 8% so using ecmo in the post lung transplant period it is a rescue measure if some patients we save them but the overall outcome mortality is uh, not so favorable uh, this graph actually shows uh, this is the survival after the lung transplant without ecmo and if they require ecmo in the post transplant period the survival is definitely reduced ah uh, this is another interesting case a 49 year old male from delhi he had covid 19 then he was on niv then he had uh, in mechanical intubation extubation failed then again on ventilation tracheostomy done he was getting uh, worse his uh, ct was worsening so finally he was sh shifted to our center this is the ct thorax when he came here the lungs were totally destroyed but we continued the ventilation however his gas exchange everything worsened saturation became 70s then we put him on vv ecmo so he was on vv ecmo we waited for almost a month time uh, to see whether the lung improves but his uh, lung did not improve this is the patient on vv ecmo and uh, finally uh, we got a, a suitable lung did the bilateral lung transplantation usually in uh, transplantation first the bronchus is bronchial anastomosis done then the pulmonary venous anastomosis then the pulmonary arterial anastomosis this is the surgical uh, anastomosis of the bronchus and in the post transplant period we did the bronchoscopy the bronchial anastomosis is good the distal uh, uh, bronchia uh, bronchi are healthy this is the explanted lung if you look at the lungs which had covid 
totally destroyed. You can't even make that it is lung. We also did the histopathological studies. We couldn't make out any of the lung tissues, no alveolar, nothing we could make out, no pneumocytes. So this is the, in the post-transplant period. Very next day, we could put him on TPs. Of course, he was on ECMO for very long, bedridden. This is a chest X-ray in the post-transplant period. It took almost one month's time for us to move him out of the ICU. So to conclude, uh, uh, ECMO is uh, used both in heart transplant and lung transplant. So if it is used in the pre-transplant period for a heart, um, heart failure patients, mortality is slightly higher as compared to heart transplant done in patients who are not on ECMO. However, in the post-transplant period, if there is a ventricular dysfunction and you put, it, put them on ECMO, the outcome is good. Whereas in lung transplant situation, it is the vice versa. If the patient is in lung failure and you put them on ECMO till they get a lung, the outcome is good. Whereas you do the lung transplant, then put the patient on ECMO, then they will have higher mortality. So it's a team effort. It's not uh, transplant. There are various uh, logistics involved. Sometimes we may have to go to other city. One team will go to the other city. One team will be here. Then coordinating, we have to get the organ in appropriate time. Look at the minimizing the ischemic time. So uh, all people will contribute to this. Thank you. Again, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry that I have to leave by 7.30 if you don't mistake me. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if Shukumar, can I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, sir. Please. Uh, we'll leave him early also. Thanks a lot, uh, Suresh, for uh, the presentation. And in fact, there was very, I mean, a um, few messages in the chat box, uh, highly complimentary about your work, basically. And one single question, uh, was by Dr. Anita about whether training is available in your institute. Yes. Uh, see, initially it is uh, informal training because uh, our unit does around 100 to 150 ECMOs per year. So now we have started a, a regular fellowship, uh, one year fellowship in ECMO. So, but so many centers know they would like to send the people for a short duration. So we, we are allowing uh, 15 days or one month uh, period. It's not a formal uh, ECMO training, but they come here because they are all experienced uh, intensivist, cardiac surgeons. They just need yeah. to get some, uh, some uh, clues and uh, just to improve their yeah. technique. Just join the loose ends and uh, yeah. get going. Okay. Little bit about the team you attend, you brought up... Uh, I mean, there was a photograph of the whole team. Uh, just give, it, now give us the outline. So, of course, you were there with another gentleman in the middle. So, who are the, what are the crucial uh, parts of a team, basically? See, there is uh, uh, heart transplant and lung transplant teams. That's why I put uh, two photos. Okay. So, in the heart transplant, uh, Dr. K.R. Balakrishnan is the cardiothoracic surgeon. He's the uh, main uh, surgeon. Then we have assistant surgeons. Then um, I have a large team, 20 uh, team of people, all cardiac anesthesiologists. So we take care of the assessing the organs. Our team will go to the other cities, assess the heart. We do the TE. Then along with one surgeon for harvesting. Then we are, of course, anesthesia and perioperative care is uh, taken care of by the anesthesiologist. We also take care of the post-transplant uh, patients in the ICU and putting them on ECMO, removal of the ECMO, all those things are taken care of by us only. And we have heart failure to cardiologist. Usually when we started the team, we didn't have a heart failure cardiologist. In fact, I was taking care of most of the cardiac cath, everything. But now we have a, a, a cardiac heart failure clinic uh, and a team led by Dr. Ravi Kumar. So they yeah. are doing a wonderful job. Yeah. The other picture is uh, lung team. We have pulmonologist, uh, 
because some of the lung transplant patient may require stenting all those things so they will get involved in the lung transplant patients but it, what i am trying to ask next is maybe very unusual in the sense of pregnancy and ecmo was there at any point yeah. of time you you had to handle yeah i think uh, it is possible to do ecmo in a pregnant lady also especially uh, when they are uh, having severe amniotic fluid embolisma and so many other things where otherwise they will die so it is possible uh, only thing uh, their cardiac output will be there will be in hyperdynamic uh, circulation so the ecmo flow if you are using va ecmo the ecmo flow has to be maintained in a higher range uh, of course there will be challenges but it is possible and uh, it can be safely done the results are as comparable to the other patients gangadhar sir sir yes sir ah uh, dr suresh actually for only for curiosity i think uh, during covid time and this thing covid 19 the ecmo you know it was there and all this thing every people had started discussing regarding ecmo and that to your hospital has done mgm healthcare has done very well and that to sp balasubramanyam has taken care of that you know that so i would like to for this one in covid 19 patient what may be the indication for uh, ecmo uh, dr suresh uh, indication in covid or other situation covid 19 covid 19 okay, okay. so okay. we have a definite criteria uh obviously they will have ards they are oxygen dependent everything on ventilator everything suppose we look at the pf ratio if it yes. is less than 150 with a 90% fio2 and plateau pressure more than 30 cm of water because if you are ventilating with high airway pressure invariably it will cause barotrauma and uh, it they will not the lung will not recover beyond that time and uh pco2 if it is more than 80 and the ph is less than 7.1 uh, so these are the criteria to put them on ecmo and we also look at the murray score if it is more than 3 so these are all the objective criteria now ideally the patient should be on ventilator less than 7 days then the outcomes are good but if they are on uh, ventilators beyond 7 days in fact some of the countries they will not even consider the patient for ecmo but we had some patients who were on a uh, ventilator for almost one month then we did the uh, trans i mean ecmo and the uh, they recovered and went home also yeah. and there are some contraindication especially if they have cerebral uh, bleeding they are not awake and ct shows some changes and gi bleed some of the and multi organ and dysfunction then they are not candidate for uh, ecmo and second thing is what we found in the first uh, wave no uh, we used to wean off the ecmo in 2 to 3 weeks time but uh, you are not even able to and in fact uh, the mortality was higher in the, the first wave because probably we were not uh, very well uh, experienced but we did uh, around uh, 10 lung transplant when the lung, lungs did not recover and almost 50% of the patients went home in the second wave we had very good results because most of the patients were coming early stage so that the ecmo was instituted at the appropriate time thank you thank you suresh you and i we asked this question because one of my friend is a physician dr k babu he was admitted in bangalore manipal i think uh, <laughs> here they take him yeah. here he was there in ecmo for more than 44 days or 45 days and ecmo uh, that is thing even afterwards the plan for lung transplant but it was not possible mm-hmm. right now also is oxygen dependent is there in the house actually yeah but i yeah. think in the second wave mm-hmm. we had a patient who was on ecmo for one month outside he is from bhuvaneswar they were on ecmo for more than 3 months then we could wean off the ecmo but he was requiring some 15 liter oxygen 15. then finally discharged with 6 liter today no oxygen so surprisingly lung has recovered well very beautiful so, yeah yeah so you can't predict yeah uh, another one interesting question i think uh, this is out of the v why i think ecmo i think uh, everybody is not affordable or anything i think the cost price why the little high uh, in case of ecmo dr suresh 
Yeah. See, the ECMO as such, the oxygenator will cost around uh, around two lakh. So, especially the standard oxygenator. Yes. Then we use all the cannula, everything heparin coated, and the ECMO machine itself is fifty lakh capital investment. The hospital will try to <clears throat> get something out of you. Yeah. And finally, when the patient is in ICU, daily we have to do uh, TEG, then uh, ACTs, then uh, various blood investigations. So you need the extra nurse. So the maintenance of ECMO is also expensive. That's why ECMO is more expensive. Very, very nice of it. Uh, because it was a very curious to everybody why this one will be they becoming at the end of this one, one, one pro, one, yeah, so many things will be there. People used to afraid for all the things uh, mm -hmm. regarding this. The way you are telling, the way you are expressing, it looks so simple. Uh, and that is the thing, uh, the interesting thing I asked uh, Dr. Spesho. Okay. I think you were hospitalized, I think, during this time. I think they lifted patients from airlift from different parts of the country. Uh, I know that uh, there is this thing regarding our hospital. They done a good results, no doubt about it. Anyhow, thank you. Thank you. Very nice, sir. Ramesh, sir, just if you have uh, some uh, few minutes, just I uh, can uh, speak to uh, Ramesh, sir. Do you have a few minutes? Sorry, in a hurry to go, sir. Dr. Manjunath here, sir. President ISA, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Ramesh, sir? Suresh, Suresh, yeah. Suresh. Yeah, Suresh, Suresh, sorry, sir, Suresh. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah sure. sir. Sorry, sir. You can, sorry. please, please. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Yeah. Manjanath here, sir. Sir, yeah. do you have any uh, intraoperative? What is the role of the anesthesiologist during that intraoperative, sir? Intraoperative yeah. period, yeah, yeah. Role of anesthesiologist as far as uh, anesthesiologist is concerned. In the heart transplant, uh, usually the patients are very sick. They are in severe heart failure. They can collapse anytime. So, uh, we should be ready with uh, to go on emergency bypass or emergency ECMO. That is uh, induction period. And of course, we have to mo monitor the pulmonary artery pressure. We insert a PA catheter. We also monitor the continuous cardiac output because we have we, we usually we measure the PVR, SVR, cardiac output, all the parameters before the transplant. And uh, on bypass, again, maintaining all the organ perfusion, looking at the whether the oxygenation is happening, all bypass-related monitoring, and transesophageal echo, so that while coming off bypass, how is the ventricular function? What is the, to look at any anastomotic narrowing. Yes, they do a lot of anastomosis, SVC, IVC, PA, IOTA. We do the TE and look at any turbulent flow across these things. Sometimes we can't come off bypass then to find the reason for it. Basically, it is the cardiac surgeons and cardiac anesthesiologists only will be there. So we have troubleshooting is the most important thing. So yes, sir. Uh, sir, one more thing, sir. Yeah. Yeah, one more sir. If the patient is an echo, is there any incident of surgery? Is there, is there any any documentation, any evidence or any literature says that echo with some other surgeries, incident of surgeries? If yeah. the patient is an echo. Yeah. If the patient is on ECMO, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Because we had some cases. One patient had a severe GI bleed. Yes, so GI bleed, first endoscopic, all those things they done, but still uh, the bleeding was continued. Then see if you don't do anything, patient is uh, bled to death. So in such situation, we'll take the risk and uh, we'll control the bleeding surgically. Second patient was. Uh, had a cerebral hemorrhage. So we did a, a, a craniotomy and decompress the brain. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, other thing is uh, one patient had uh, uh, bleeding in the pleural cavity. So we put a chest tube, but it started draining like anything. Then finally we did the thoracotomy, found the bleeder, packed it and closed it. So it is possible, but uh, bleeding is the I mean, no, can be, just can my, my, my point, sir, my point is, say, can we give muscle relaxants and just like our what, what we are giving anesthesia, sir? Yes. The, yeah, that is. Yes. Muscle relaxants. Yes. Muscle relaxants, sedation, everything you have to give. And we, in fact, we stop heparin. We can and run there, more without heparin also. Is there any effect on pharmacokinetics and phonodynamics uh, dynamics are similar or a little bit different? Yeah, it is a little bit different because the total circulating volume will be more. So the volume of the drugs, which depends upon the volume of distribution, then you have to give more. 
so apart from and antibiotic for example cholestin all those things some of the antibiotics you have to give in a higher dose yes, but otherwise uh, anesthesia it's same we usually monitor the bis so that we, our titration of anesthetics depends upon the patient's awareness thank you sir thank you for a nice lecture sir yeah. okay thank you thank you very much we'll move on to the next topic thank you uh, uh, there, are, there are questions there no no he, 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 uh, sir vijayanand sir he is uh, you want to move to move 7:30 is some other uh, yeah, appointment okay. question anything i can just answer yeah another 5 minutes still there okay 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 which vasopressor or inotropes are used maximum yeah this is i will talk about the post to heart transplant period because your uh, dopa all those things may not work they are all indirect acting uh, agent so we use uh, direct acting either adrenaline or isoprenaline is a very good dinotropic oh. agent because it reduces the pulmonary artery pressure so okay. it is okay, good sir. for the right ventricle so isoprenaline is uh, one of the often uh, used anotrope and adrenaline coming to vasopressors most of these heart failure patients they may be on vimada ac inhibitor so many things they are severely vasodilatory sometimes they get angry no the situations when you uh, come off uh, bypass in the post heart transplant period their bp will be 60 70 cardiac output is 10 liter so they are severely vasodilated the cardiac output is very high so such situations we use vasopressors noradrenaline and vasopressin and of course we monitor the pvr svr everything if the our aim is to keep the svr around 1200 dynes uh, per second per centimeter role of levosimendan sir levosimendan not in the post transplant period in the pre transplant period if they are in severe heart failure sometimes we do try levosimendan in the pre transplant period in the post transplant period sometimes if they are severely vasoconstricted especially after 2 days because of the low cardiac output then we do use milrinone or levosimendan yeah uh, if any questions can be asked uh, somebody has questions. asked whether suresh rao is trained outside the country i was in uh, germany bad wiener hospital who were doing transplants and elvats that was for a brief period but uh, majority of the things are uh, <laughs> innovations i will tell you one example interesting case uh, we there there was one child this is uh, 10 years 10 years back there was in child in one of the hospital they wanted to put the patient on ecmo so our cardiac surgeon they were surgeons were the one who were doing so he asked me come we we'll go so we went there it was uh, hardly 10 or 12 kg child he said can you put uh, percutaneous cannula and put the on ecmo i have not heard of no cannula nothing i said i will do you know what i did we use a pediatric aortic cannula when you go on bypass in a child we use a small cannula so i use that cannula i punctured the femoral vein then use a triple lumen dilator dilated the tract then with the dilator i inserted the cannula and put the child on ecmo that was the first time i mean not heard of also now we get a good percutaneous scan so thank you sir if there are no case no questions uh, so i think uh, we will move on to the next lecture sir sir one one short question yeah, yes, sir, sir. sir. Yeah. balu subramanyam uh, uh, balu uh, senior was there admitted uh, uh, briefly what was your experience there see actually he was uh, recovering well he was off uh, almost to ventilator he was on pressure support uh, we were weaning off ecmo he was doing well in fact the previous day he was sitting and uh, he deflated the tricostomy cuff he spoke and he said voice is good actually next day i had a case in one of the other cities they sent a chartered flight for ecmo one of the vip patient and on the flight they tried to contact from the hospital it seems i didn't get once i landed they said uh, he's unconscious 
Then they did a CT that time he had the severe uh, hemorrhage. So neurosurgeon said uh, no point in opening. Otherwise lung, all other things he was good. But uh, probably hemorrhage related to, uh, I mean, that was uh, uh, issue. Otherwise you could have come out well. And one of the reason what we have seen in COVID ECMO, the bleeding were more. Compa other ECMOs, we don't see so many bleeding complications, but in COVID, uh, the bleeding complications were more. He should have survived. <laughs> it's uh, very sad that we lost. We were exhausted at the end. No? You do all the good things and you are improving. Suddenly you see something. Yeah. Yeah. That's life. Vijayanand, <laughs> okay. any questions? Vijayanand? Thank you, sir. Thank you. So for kind of you. Thank, Thank you, sir. So we'll move on to the next uh, uh, topic. Uh, I, I hand over to Dr. S. P. Gangadhar, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, Shukuma, yes. just sir. No, the one minute, yes. sir. Just uh, okay. okay. Uh, Interview. If you don't mind, sir. Hey, no, 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 not at all. Not at all. Oh, yes, sir. Sir, the, the Dr. Krishna, the uh, Dr. Shishidhar, sir. So just yes. uh, because uh, Shishidhar sir actually is supposed to do it last uh, some seminar only last uh, webinar and uh, there was some lot of con some, uh, confusion was there then uh, they finally agreed uh, to do it on this uh, webinar webinar actually uh, we are coordinating since one and after two months so for, uh, finally we got him he is very busy and he came to India also we were we were very busy and now we agreed to and uh, speak on this uh, lecture and he is agreed to continue uh, continue his support for his for this webinar for another uh, uh, some six to six months to one year he agreed uh, in, in that way so he is uh, i think uh, one of my close friend introduced uh, dr shishidhar sir and he agreed and from uk only he, so he wanted to lend a support regarding the academics of karnataka asa so i just i wanted to thank him for that and uh, now i'll uh, Dr. Gangadhar, to, uh, to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Shishidhar, sir, and uh, go ahead with the uh, sir. I will request Gangadhar, sir, to uh, chair the session and uh, introduce him. Uh, thank you, Manjana. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very uh, much. Sir. So today I'm uh, really lucky because of my close friend, also my well-wisher, uh, Dr. M.K. Shashidhara, or Madhapura Krishnamurti Shashidhara, to introduce to the all the audience and all the things. Actually, the well-known personality doesn't need any introduction really speaking, but he has done a lot of work. We have to remember today, he has bring the British everything, the appointments, even for the selection of the candidate in, in India. It is a main intention. He is in a, a director for medical education. He has got an, he's occupied the very highest post in UK and made a lot of achievements to bring the whole thing, selection of the team, selection of the candidate for the different specialities and all this thing. Our uh, current post is holding in a deputy lead for the quality and also MCH and international nurse program and global training and education center. So honorary senior lecturer in Edge Hill University and also associate specialist anesthetist in international medical graduate tutor and stepping in hospital and stock porch. Like that, he's got a lot of things to be doing. He's got a membership, British Medical Association, associate member of Royal College of Anesthetists and associate of anesthetist, this one, like many, many. And he got awards and distinction to his back. He has got a postgraduate education award 2021 and he has asked tutor lead award 2022, like that many things. And he's got a lot of teaching roles, stimulation lead, DTC, ATLS course, echo listening and communication skill upgrade like this. So other roles he gives, he, he done a lot of wonderful things. So we are happy to receive our, our man uh, with us today. So we are lucky to have this, even with busy schedule. He made up his mind to be spared some time with us. Thank you, Sashidhar. Thank you, Professor Gangadhar, uh, for the introduction. And, and thank you, Manjanath. Yes, the, one of the main motto of the Global Medical Education uh, and the Global Transmitting Center is to collaborate, and, uh, have a knowledge exchange based on uh, mutual respect and exchanging collaboration for better education across the globe. So in that sense, what you said earlier is true that uh, we would, so long as the Karnataka State Association of the Anesthesiologists wants, we would want to support that uh, in all different aspects. Um, I also want to thank all the office bearer of, bearers of the Karnataka State uh, ISA branch 
for giving me the opportunity to talk to various trainees and other people in Karnataka. And, and, and uh, I would act also seek blessing from my own guru, Dr. Gurudath, and the man who taught me anesthesia. And, and, and it's, it's a great honor that he's there listening to me as well. Uh, fantastic. So what I thought I would do is I got a presentation of oral anticoagulants and generally anticoagulants and anesthesia. Uh, before I start, I thought I would just do a call first. I just got eight questions. I'm going to run that first, then I'll move on to my talk. If it is okay with you, all of you. So yeah, yeah. let me share first. It's mainly for me as for others. So, can you tell me if you can see the screen? Yes, sir. Right. So what needs yeah, to happen for everyone who is attending this, if on your mobile phone or any device, if you just go to paulev.com, slash Shashi M160. And you can answer these questions. So I also got one is open for that. I'm also going to do the same thing just to make sure it is working for everyone. So it is working for me. So I'm hoping that it's working for everybody else as well. So I'm going to move on. The first question is following or the anticoagulant drugs. Um, it, is, it is not come. Exactly, they want they want it to come. Right. Okay. We've got few responses coming there. Just going to give a couple more. So I'm just going to five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm just going to look at what the right answers are. The warfarin syndrome is another kind of uh, similar to warfarin. It's another cumarin derivative. Debigatron, rivaroxaban, leprodin, something which we use for people who are allergic to heparin, or gertroban. So everybody, so this is fantastic because as an anticoagulation lead, the commonest things I get from the surgeon is patient is on aspirin to get uh, Patient is on anticoagulant. Can you do something about it? Fantastic. So let's just go on to the next question. So next question is coming. So following are directly acting anticoagulant drugs. <coughs> so another five seconds, five, four, three, Two, one. Just want to right. Right. Debigatron, heparin, rivaroxaban are considered as direct acting oral anticoagulants or direct acting anticoagulants, whereas warfarin and syndrome they were 
indirectly. They are called indirectly acting or also called vitamin K antagonists. So I'll come to that in my talk. The next question. Following are the half-life of the following drugs. Now, look at some responses. So, plasma half-life of warfarin and Synthrome, Debigatron, Pirorax about 18 to 23, effective half-life of unfractionated heparin, 30 minutes, 90 minutes, Fondoparinex, 48 hours. Five, four, three, Two, one. So, plasma half life of warfarin is 36 to 48 hours. Debegat in 18 to 17. Ravrax burn is slightly shorter, which is between 11 to 13 hours or 5 to 9 hours, depending on the age of the patient. Uh, heparin is 30 minutes, it's intravenous, 90 minutes if it's subcutaneous. Uh, Fundoparinex is around 30, uh, 17 to 21 hours rather than 48 hours. Next question. Select the three common reasons for using long-term anticoagulation. I'm talking about anticoagulation for a period of more than 12 weeks. Just going to give five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. So stroke prevention, commonest cause. Next commonest cause is VTE or venous thromboembolism. Mechanic heart failure does a significant number of patients who are on. This is mainly, I'm talking about European and the UK, it's probably the same, similar figures would probably be the same in India in the last five years, because things have moved on quite pretty quickly in India as well. Next question. Following tests are important in monitoring and managing anticoagulant agents. INR for warfarin, APTT for heparin, APTT for rivaroxaban, dilute thrombin time for debigatron, PT and APTT for apixaban. Five, four, three, two, one. INR is the gold standard for mon monitoring warfarin and syndrome. APTT is the gold standard test for uh, monitoring heparin. Uh, dilute thrombin can be used for monitoring anticoagulant effect, not for monitoring, rather than to see whether Debigatron is there or not. That's the only test. Uh, APTT and PT and APTT are notoriously not reliable for Ravaroxaban or any other new oral anticoagulant agents. Next question. The following are the components of what was triad. Vascular injury, hyperpoiable state, smoking, malignancy, circulatory status. So I'm sorry, there's a spelling mistake. It is there in that circulatory stasis needs to be read. So five, four, three, two, one. Right, I think it's uh, com the Components of worker trials are vascular injury, hypercarbonate state, and superior status. It is very important to preoperatively assessing this patient. Mm -hmm. Next one following drug 
not for elective surgery for a for the mentioned duration for a given duration of the mentioned duration select the correct answer warfarin syndrome for 5 to 6 days maybe get run with normal renal function 48 hours funda perinex for 3 days abixaban for 2 days unfractionated heparin for 6 hours Five, four, three, two, one. Warfarin uh, syndrome between five to six days, depending on the level of INR. We tend to say five days for anybody who's on atrial fibrillation and a mechanical mitral bar, it's usually six days. Then we get to with normal renal function is 48 hours. For the parenex is three days, abixaban is uh, every answer is correct for that. The last question before I move on to my talk. Following drugs are the right reversal agents for the anticoagulant drugs. Fresh frozen plasma or plasma put in uh, PPC or the Beriplex, which is called or warfarin. Andaxanate alpha for abixaban, proxbine for debigat, andaxanate alpha for rivaroxaban. Five, four, three, two, one. Yes, the FFPR PPC are the ones which we normally use for emergency reversal of warfarin. Proxpine is the chelating agent which is used for the bigatron. Andaxanate alpha is not. License for apixaban does not work for apixaban, so it's only for rivaroxaban and endoxaban and pratixaban as an option. License use. Thank you. So I'm just going to move on to my presentation now. And if there is time, we'll come back to this. Otherwise, I've given you most answers anyway. With that. But let me just get my presentation up. I think Professor Gangadhar has already introduced me. I don't need to go through the picture on the on the on the area. Yes. Yeah. Uh, innovation award of the patient safety is something which was which I'm very very proud of. That's the reason why I can talk about anticoagulation because my anesthetist life has been around anticoagulation for many years. Many people would usually expect this from a hematologist, somebody like that. But I have done a lot of the work on anticoagulation from 2006 onwards. And in 2014, I wrote a database program for the NHS, for which I had the innovation award from the Association of Anesthetists. That's the picture what you can see. You see from the president of the Association of Anesthetists. I work in uh, different places. So I'm an anesthetist in uh, Stockport Energy Foundation Trust, but I also work for the Global Education Training Center. Uh, some of the things which we do, so that's my team. We run the airway workshops, ATLS workshop, ultrasound spinal regeneration workshop. Some of our surgeons run cadaveric uh, workshops. And Couple of things. I still do some sessions as on behalf of Boringa, one of the companies who sponsors some of my talks. I don't recommend any particular product. My opinion is purely based on current evidence available. I do it voluntarily for this. I don't get paid. I don't charge anything from the drug companies. My objective for the next 30 minutes is to go a little bit about what oral anticoagulant agents are and to 
try and see whether we can learn about balance the risk of thrombosis, what is the risk of bleeding for elective procedures, and the risk analysis for elective surgery. Bit of touch about regional anesthesia. Emergency surgery, lab anesthesia are, are of any use. I probably will probably come back if Dr. Manjan wants me and do it as another talk because I also have another session to run for the international doctor's induction and may not have enough time to do that. But let me see, depending on how things go, I do. So, so that's what I'm going to cover. Quite happy to take any questions if anybody wants you to intervene. Some of the members here will the first thing says, if you want to stop and ask me some question, please do so. Uh, I'm, I, I'm quite ha happy to be interrupted. The first thing is classification. Commonest things we ask in the examination is classify oral uh, anticoagulant drugs. There are indirectly acting oral anticoagulant drugs, directly acting oral anticoagulant drugs, a mixed some of the heparins. So there are both parental oral and the drugs which are not, ha don't have any anticoagulant effects are antiplatelet agents, which are aspirin, clopidogrel, or dipyrimidone. So indirect acting oral anticoagulants mainly are vitamin K antagonists, warfarin and synthrone. Slightly, the difference between the two is not much. We use synthrone for those patients who are sensitive to warfarin or intolerant to warfarin. That's all. So after the first five days of treatment, the half-life of both warfarin and syndrome is exactly the same. It's only in the first week, syndrome has a much shorter half-life. Other than that, for all practical purposes, the half-life is the same, the duration of it is the same. And duration of time, you need to withheld them for elective surgical procedures is the same. Directly acting oral anticoagulants, heparins have got both direct and indirect effects. Debigatron, Ravaraxidone, or Indoparamet. I will come to each one of them in a second. So let's talk about warfarin and Synthrom first. So essentially, they are all humorine derivatives. Essentially, they work on preventing vitamin K dependent clotting factors to be activated. That's their main action. So the two drugs I've got is a compound which you see on the screen is a warfarin sodium. And the way it acts is it prevents activation of factors. The factors which you're talking about is factor two, seven, nine, ten. And not to forget, there are also other factors which have been found later on, protein S, protein C, and protein Z. They do have very minor direct effect on prothrombin. There is small effect, about 10% effect of warfarin on prothrombin conversion to thrombin. So it uh, does have some effect. It's negligible. Why warfarin? Warfarin is probably dominated the anticoagulant market for many, many years, essentially because of has a predictable onset and uh, duration of action. The onset of action when it's given is about 90 minutes, it does take time to stabilize the action. It's got a very reliable bioavailability. Saves life, very cheap. So especially warfarin, in fact, in common man words, it's essentially a rat poison. It's very cheap. The problem with warfarin is it has a very long duration action. That's where the problem is. Because of that, it also the, has got a very long life, half-life. Challenging reversal. You can't reverse it very, very quickly by giving vitamin K. But if you give vitamin K, it can also make them hyper -coagul -coagul uh, you know, they They tend to clot more for the first two weeks when you try to restart the walking. So they go into hypercoagulant state. 
prothrombic thrombotic when stopped or reversed needs monitoring there are a lot of drug and food interactions that's the other problem the bioavailability is affected by drug interactions so we use what is known as inr so i'm sure you all know inr is a standardized test they use what is known as a human brain thromboplasty agent which was first created in 1962 and i'm sure you all know that british are very good in monopolizing this they have been doing that for centuries until about 1985 every country everybody in the world has to buy thromboplastin standard from uk so this was not acceptable because who interfered 1977 can you imagine so many years of negotiation then the who designated a batch of human brain thromboplastin currently we have uh, i think there are three in 1985 1977 they did that but it didn't really come into use until about 1982 we now have one primary and three second reference thromboplastins the mono monopoly was replaced by what is known as the international sensitivity index the calibration model was used in 1982 and standardized to be used across the world and it is actually uh, doesn't cost much money now essentially i'm not going to go great detail about how inr is derived it's essentially a standard between the patient prothrombin and ekns the standard prothrombin time set by the thromboplastin and the log of inr is the one which you're going to use at a prothrombin time important point to remember is inr is a test for warfarin and syndrome alone INR is not the test for anything else. INR has no value for monitoring any other drugs. INR has got some value and effect in monitoring patients with liver failures, but that is we are looking at prothrombin time, not INR. Directly acting oral anticoagulants, there are different varieties. There is something known as anti-TNA agents. So if you just look at all the names on the screen everyone except fondaparin x has got x a in the name so all the rivaroxaban abixaban edoxaban pradaxaban they're all anti tna agents so they are they block factor tna and we also got something known as anti 2a agent or the dibigatron so dibigatron tra is the thrombin inhibitor they're all from the inhibitors so also ergotroban so obviously antitna works on activation of factor 10a and direct from the inhibitors to be get from common indication for anticoagulant medications atrial fibrillation is is top of the list so i'm can only give you the figure from uk because that's where i've been working currently there are about nearly 900000 people in england alone are affected by atrial fibrillation the true prevalence is about 2.4% and that number of people who have atrial fibrillation is increasing i was shocked when i came to this country in 1998 that i won't go home without seeing a, a patient with atrial fibrillation once a week the things have changed so much that I would probably see a patient with atrial fibrillation every day. Well, many times I've probably seen more than that. In our perioperative anticoagulation training for pre-op assessment, we see about between 1,000, 1,500 patients on oral anticoagulants and 70% of them have atrial fibrillation. Why atrial fibrillation is important? Patients, patients with atrial fibrillations are five times more likely to have a stroke or thromboembolism than without the atrial fibrillation and it does cost a lot of money it does cost a lot of morbidity so aim is to prevent strokes and try and treat atrial fibrillation we can't control af completely we can control the rate 
But we, what we can't do is we can't stop them throwing up crops. That's why they need anticoagulation. So this is the one of the key target for the government in terms of preventing deaths. So preventing cardiovascular disease, the atrial fibrillation is one of the key. Indication for oral direct anticoagulant drugs. Atrial fibrillation. So we're talking about both direct and indirect. Direct anticoagulant drugs can be used for atrial fibrillation so long they don't have a value of heart disease. The mainly valve well, heart disease we're talking about is mitral valve disease. Somebody's got a mitral valvular disease. We can't put them on devigatron. We can put them over four. But majority of the patients nowadays, they'll be on one of the new oral anticoagulant agents. Valvular hair patients, like metastinosis, artificial valves, are tend to treat with warfarin. However, in over the last two years, there have been a lot of trials going on about patients on with aortic valve having new oral anticoagulant agents. Second commonest thing is venous thromboembolism. The incidence of DVT is about one in 1,000 in UK. I see between 90 to 120 PEs in a year. So our population, the population of Stockport a Hospital, where we can see is 300,000. So that's the number of PEs. And essentially it is used to prevent DVT or treatment of DVT or PE. So third commonest reason why patients are uh, on uh, anticoagulant drugs is mechanical heart valves. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, direct acting oral uh, anticoagulant drugs. The current we got Debigatron, Rivaroxaban, Abixaban, Adoxaban. We just started seeing some patients with Bradoxaban that half-life, the renal function are somewhat similar. Debigatron is the one which is heavily dependent on re, uh, renal excretion. So the half-life vary depending on the renal function. So that needs to be taken into consideration. Debigatron is reversible. We have a uh, reliable reversible agent. We also started getting some other reversible agents Cost is a big factor in terms of using reversal agents. Debigatron is dialyzable when compared to other drugs. It are not dialyzable. Uh, Rivaroxaban has got two different half-life depending on the age of the patient. So people who are 75 plus tend to take much longer, have a much longer half-life. 30% renal dependent. It was quite difficult to get rid of warfarin in terms of as a choice of medication to prevent strokes or DVT. So what the drug trials, very different drug trials, which was involved, compared warfarin against the newer oral anticoagulants. So what they decided to do was to compare how good those drugs are against warfarin rather than looking at direct, they're looking at whether they are superior or inferior, or are they what is known as a non-inferior trials. So, did, so essentially what they did was to look at, if you were to compare warfarin against any of these drugs, they also work as well as warfarin. They are not inferior to warfarin. That's the kind of endpoint they were looking at. So safety endpoint was one of major bleeding. When it comes to major bleeding, they're talking about Intracranial bleed, the second one they are looking at a uh, gastrointestinal bleed. So looking at that, so if you can look at this, most drugs except abixaban does have slightly major bleeding. This is the major bleeding both intracranial as well gastrointestinal. If you then subdivide into intracranial bleeding, which has a small, far more significant impact on survival, rehabilitation, and all kinds of things, the new oral anticoagulant drugs are 
were superior than Warfield. So that was one of the good things. However, most of them tend to make them bleed more. So you would see in your practice, analysis practice, I see it. Sometimes patients are put on tabigatron, have a bit of JM bleed, then they stop it. They have a bit of money, they put them on another one. So there will be some trial and error will go on between the cordialists and the patients. It's common that that, is, that, that happens. Occasionally, they would not tolerate either of the drugs and they will be put on work. The beauty of uh, new oral anticoagulant drugs is they don't need routine monitoring. They don't need to come to anticoagulation clinics every month. They don't need monthly INR tests. I'm not going to the medical part because I do this talk to the medics as well. This is the how they arrive at what drug to go. All I'm going to say is Devigatron is the only one which is contraindicated if the creatinine clearance is less than 30. We want to skip that. Parent, parental anticoagulant drugs, heparin. We also got low molecular heparin, which has slightly longer half-lives, which can be used. It doesn't need to be used as an infusion. Fundaparinex, another factor 10A agent, which is parental, sometimes use it for patients with uh, heparin allergy, patients who doesn't want to take uh, drugs which is derived, uh, uh, derived from pork, because heparin and lomacare heparin have, have some manufacturing, some ingredient from porcine. So uh, in those patients, we tend to use Fundaparinex, Another thrombinemic agartaband is somebody has been given heparin, they develop heparin induced thrombocytopenia, we switch them over to that. Another uh, anti and coagulant drug, most commonly used in the cath lab rather than for this. Fundaparinex, it's injectable, factor 10 inhibitor, quite a long half life, 17 20 hours. Profactic doses 2.5, triple dose 7.5 milligrams. X-ray by kidney as unchained drug. Incidence of post-op hematoma is high. So we tend not to put them preoperatively, but however, it is a part of the protocol for treating patients with acute coronary syndrome or NMI. Prophylactic dose takes 36 to 48 hours, so quite a long time. So that's why you need to stop it for Three days in UK, four days in uh, US, they stop it for four days. Uh, try to avoid indwelling catheters. Going to the pre op assessment. Pre op assessment, first we're looking at risk of thrombosis. So I already had an MCQ on uh, Virkos triad. triad consists of three things hypercoagulable state, vascular wall injury. Circular state stasis. There are various different things for high school injury, surgical trauma, chemical irritation. Doing even a puncture can cause thrombosis, superficial acid deep, indwelling catheters, alteration blood flow, hypertensive patients are, tend to be more chance of getting DVTs or stroke, rough and surface, prolonged atherosclerosis, inflammation, endotoxin, sepsis, presence of valves. Hypergoggable state, malignancy, pregnancy, contraceptive pills, thrombophilia, trauma, sepsis, inflammatory disease, nephrotic syndrome, circular states, atrial fibrillation, we talked about ventricular dysfunction, other kind of arrhythmias, other than atrial fibrillations, any kind of obstruction, immobility, paralysis, prolonged air travel, varicose vein, venous stasis of some sort. They all cause that. So the thing which we use in the pre-op assessment is this. We're looking at the risk stratification in terms of what is the risk of thrombosis. Common patient, things patients come and ask, what are my risk of thrombosis if I were to stop my warfarin, if I were to stop my oral anticoagulant drugs? So this is what will give us some idea about whether we need to do 
something when we stop the oral anticoagulant medications. Do we need to stop them? And when you do stop them, do we need to do something to make them clot for a short duration of time until they have the surgery? So for example, patient who has got a, any mechanical mitral valve or any old atrial valve, so any valve in UK, which was done before 2000, it was more of a cage ball valve, which tend to clot, they were as bad as mitral valve, or anybody who's had a recent stroke or a TAA, they are considered to have very high risk of thrombosis if they got that. So in addition, that if you look at patients who have got atrial fibrillation, we look at chart score. Patients who have got venous thromboembolism, we look at whether they had how many venous thromboembolic events they had. But thrombophilia, thrombophilia are the condition which make patients got more. For example, deficiency of protein C, deficiency of protein S, antiphospholipid syndrome, multiple factor five laden mutation. So uh, heterozygous uh, prothrombin and thrombin mutations or somebody having a cancer. So we look at all this, depending on that, we class them as high risk, moderate and low risk. Charts, charts essentially is a score. So for example, C is for recent congestive heart failure. Any heart failure in the last 20 years is considered hypertension, age more than 75, present of diabetes mellitus or stroke. Stroke actually gets two. So depending on the chart score, you can get chart score between zero to six. You can just about look at the confidence interval for percent per year stroke. It's about 1.9. So patient who's got a chart score of zero to four, we don't do anything. We just stop warfarin. In fact, they are on newer oral anticoagulants. We don't actually do anything. We just stop it for a short duration of time. But if they're a warfarin, we just stop. But however, if they've got a chart score between five and six, some patients with chart score of four, if they've got also other factors, we tend to breed them with low molecular weight heparin, like Clexane or Tinsaparin. Thrombophilia, I already talked about. Factor five laden, protein C deficiency. One word about antiphospholipid syndrome. Patients with antiphospholipid syndrome tend to have recurrent episodes of uh, thrombotic events, arterial thrombotic events, and every event seems to augment the further one. So they are very notorious. These are the patients who rarely be on new oral anticoagulants. They're most likely to be on warfarin. Sometimes they can be on combination of warfarin uh, along with that. Some patients who are intolerant to warfarin can be on new oral anticoagulant drugs, but they also can be put on a much higher dose or they may be on both anti platelet agents. Dual antipertensions, they are quite complex to manage. So the question that the patient is going to do, so what's the risk of somebody where you have stopped warfarin? Stopped warfarin for uh, six days or five days. So any patient with a high risk of thrombosis, like somebody who's had a mitro Michael valve replacement, DVT or AF in the six weeks, the chance is about 20 to 30 percent in the first six weeks, 15 to 20 percent, six to 12 weeks, then comes down to about 10 percent risk of arterial thrombosis per year, or 10 percent risk of venous thrombomalaria per month. Uh, putting it in the graph, that's what it is. So, this is a patient who would need some help, especially if they are on indirectly active oral anticoagulant agents, so they will need some kind of bridging. Whereas at the lower end of the scale is most often the patient's AF, we don't do anything. Uh, there's interruptions. This is low risk group. So where the chance of somebody getting is not 0.4%. So it is small. So these are patients where 
the risk of bleeding is far higher than the risk of clotting. So we balance that and we concern the patient. We tell them why we are not going to do anything. We just want to stop it. So the communication is the key part in this, in the pre-op assessment. Risk of bleeding is a rough guide to bleeding risk of procedure tend to be low risk, moderately high risk. For example, any major abdominal surgeries, major vascular surgeries, major orthopedic surgeries, thoracic surgeries are cause high risk of bleeding. Urological surgery is probably very complex as also urosurgery because urology patients most often present with hematuria. It's very, very complex to manage them. Sometimes we we tell the oral anticoagulant drugs and put them on short acting normal patient heparin for much longer time. Because one of the big key problems with urology patients, urothelium secretes urokinase. That's another reason why they bleed so more. And on the top of that, if you put them on anticoagulant, they bleed more. This is just the uh, flow chart saying how we approach. So the first step is that as is the risk of bleeding, bleeding risk is low, lower risk of thrombosis, stop offering for four to five days, depending on what they are on, and restart on the evening of the operation. If the risk of bleeding is medium, or the risk of bleeding is high, we do this. So we do stop offering, the duration is the same. We give prophylactic dose of flexin for patients with medium risk of thrombosis. They've got high risk thrombosis, we then give them treatment dose of flexin or dinsapan. That's in very brief what we do. So if they got, if the patients are on new oral anticoagulants like Debegatron, Fundapan, and Abixamar, Rinoxapan, and Atsapan, uh, if the EGFR is more than 15, we just stop it for 48 hours. The EGFR is, EGFR is more than 80, Debegatron, again, 48 hours. If there's a prolongation, 50 to 79, stop for three days. The EGFR is 30 to 49, we stop it for four days for the bigger drone. And if the EGFR is less than 30, we stop the bigger drone. EGFR is less than 15, we stop abexaban, ribaraxaban, edaxaban, we just give them BD dose of heparin. For fundaparinex, we try to avoid using preoperatively, but if they are on, we usually stop for 36 hours to 48 hours, depending on the procedure. Quick word about regional anesthesia. Regional anesthesia, uh, looking at what are the chances of spinal epidural hematomas. The incidence is pretty low, one in 150,000, one in 22,000, one in 3,000 in elderly, quite possible, both at the site of spinal or remotely. The NAP3 study picked up eight cases of vertebral canal hematoma, one in 140,000 in spinal, one in 20,000 after the perioperative epidural block. This can be a remote or at the site. It can be spontaneous internal bleeds or in other things. So there is a possibility. So problem with spinal and epidural hematoma is ischemia and causing infarction. It can be either a subdural hematoma at the distant site or epidural hematoma at the site. The risk is highest when the coagulant system is normal. Several other factors, age, experience of anesthetic, how many attempts, whether spinal epidural, anatomic abnormalities, complex procedure, or they are on other drugs, concomitant drugs. So for example, patients who are also on antiprotegic, patients who are taking herbal medications, patients who are taking garlic. So those tablets and kind of things, all those things will be important. But there will be situations where you would have to do regional anesthesia. The patient will be unfit for general anesthesia. The key message here is to do a spinal anesthetic with minimal trauma and to document and concern the patient they are going to do that and to put in the most important part is the post-operative monitoring mechanism if the patient were to have a need. So we do, we still do sometimes patient, uh, some spinal, especially elderly patient for a neck of femur because every day of delay in 
operating a patient with a fractured neck of femur increase the mortality by about 15%. So we do that, but we are very, very careful in terms of documentation, very careful in terms of instituting post-operative monitoring for neurological security. Reports of spinal tumor with NOAX and BOAX in the trials they did. There was one spinal tumor prior to RAX, so one was started in clinical trials. Major bleeding was about between two, about 3.7%. That's the level of bleeding. Level of bleeding on patients who are on anticoagulant drugs is about 4.5%. 3.7% is still less than the standard we expect. There are more J bleed than intracranial hemorrhage. Five case reports in Avaraxaban, two related to lumbar epidural, or two case reports on delegate or one related to LCC. That's the big study about fundaparinex. Again, there were a uh, study around quite a big number of patients, 5,000 plus patients, deep peripheral catheter inserted in about 27%. The rate of venous thrombosis is one person. There was no difference with our, with our catheter. And the incident of major bleeding here was 0.8%. There was no neuraxial or perineural hematoma as reported. Yes, there was significant cause of bleeding. Spinal epidemic incidents. So INR between two and three, the risk is about 3%. If the you are got INR more than four, seven percent heparin, less, less than percent therapeutic dose, similar to warfarin, prophylactic dose variation. You know we don't look at this, but it is there. So the for the neuron still waiting for the observed figures, we can only go by the trial figures for the time being. So what do different organizations do? This is our association, Oxford Anesthesia and Regional Anesthesia Association, UK and the European Society of Regional Anesthesia. So we are pretty much the same in terms of uh, 10 milligram dose, 18 numbers, low risk of bleeding procedures if you're not doing spinal or epidurals, but and if you're doing a regional anesthesia blah, where you can use pressure as a means of stopping bleeding, you can stop for 34 hours. Sometimes we are towards the safety and we stop it for. 48 hours. American so region and CC and pain medicine, they stop for three days because they tend to use a lot more indwelling catheters. Lower risk principle procedure, they stop it for 24 hours. Uh, different variation. This is Debegatron, I've already talked about. Risk of bleeding. I will let you play. Yeah. Sorry about that. It just my next talk is due. So, um, this slide essentially shows you the risk of increasing risk of uh, bleeding problems depending on whatever the block you do. You do. Local infiltration, normal risk, superficial block, normal risk. Obviously, deep blocks, epidurals, epidurals, spinal, paravertic blocks, deep blocks, the risk of bleeding is higher. I think I'm going to come back, Dr. Manjanath, if you don't mind, for another day for this talk, because this is going to take another 20 minutes. I don't think okay, I have. Sir, okay, 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 sir. So I will, I'm quite happy to talk, do another talk on emergency surgery and anticoagulants. Quite happy to take any any questions? What I have done is I have given you an overview of what oral corticoin drugs are, what are different drugs, how do you classify, how do you estimate the risk of thrombosis as the risk of bleeding, why patient clot, various different indications, why the patient presented. Very, very brief idea about what can you do in terms of preoperatively assessing them and planning their answer. Gangadhar, sir, it's over yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Shashira, actually, is an extensive, wonderful talk. And uh, we all know that you are authoritative over the coagulant, anticoagulants, because many times uh, I'm hearing your, uh, your lecture on the anticoagulants. Today, it is a still extensive, 
talk over the anticoagulants. A really a good thing. And you talk authenticatedly. There's a thing that is also another important thing. Uh, I think uh, any questions from the audience, I think I request you to answer. Sir, one question one is there particular, sir. sir. Yeah, sir. Yeah. One question is there, sir. If garlic, uh, garlic and ginger does affect coagulation, sir. Your experience on that? Yes, sir. So in herbal medications, we actually stop herbal medication preoperatively for a seven days. So we don't. So mainly, is the garlic has got it potential the effect of warfarin. So there is enough studies about garlic tablets. Garlic tablets, something which is very commonly used in UK. So somebody eating garlic in the food does not necessarily affect. So what we say to them in the preoperatively is, please avoid eating any garlic for the first 24 hours. But if they're on garlic tablets, or if they are on something known as St. John's Ward, so various verbal medication, we ask them to stop. So we, we, do, we do see <coughs> woozing in patients who had garlic tablets. Ginger, it's not something which we come across very commonly in this, in this, but ginkgo bulba is another one which you also stop. So most herbal medication, our pre-op is very, very, should we say, don't take any herbal medication for seven days. Uh, thank you, Shishdev. Sir, this. one more, sir. Just for the sake of a poster, just, there are some posters are there, sir. So, yeah. so sir, regarding this, uh, we usually they'll go to ask the, uh, the patient with the coronary stents, so and the elective surgeries. So, what is the uh, what is your story? Because recently, this uh, is ASRA guidelines are also there. So, even 89, 80, I think 89 guidelines are there also the, uh, there. Patients on and uh, so on anti dual antiplatelet therapy with uh, stents coming in for so, uh, elective uh, surgeries. Dr. Manjana, that's another talk. I, so yes. you have two more <laughs> I can do for you. One on patients on uh, uh, dual antipertent agents, especially patients on stent. Okay, for sir. Or patients on stent for coronary interventions. That's another okay. one. There's a flow chart which I do. Okay, so, sir. Uh, but what I give you, I can give you the very quick answer is that patient can be on two different kinds of stents. One is known as a drug eluting stents. Other one is bare metal stents. The most cardiologists would put drug eluting stents commonly. But however, if you've got somebody who's recently been diagnosed with a cancer and they need an urgent procedure, most cardiologists would put a what is known as a bare metal stents. The, the coronary stent thrombosis or the stent thrombosis in somebody who's had a stroke is very high in the first six weeks if they've got bare metal stents. So that's the time we've got to be very, very careful. If they haven't got a, if they have got a non-urgent surgical condition, which can be delayed for the, more than six weeks, we delay it. We continue both the antiplatelet agents. We stop clopidogrel and ticagrel are for between two to five days, depending on the surgeon. We do do what is known as a multidisciplinary meeting with the cardiologist, with the surgeon. I get involved in that. And we make a, a proper decision based on the patient. We tell the patient why we're doing this. And we tend to operate on patients on aspirin. We don't stop aspirin at all. And we need, we are far more careful. So we get some platelets. We have other things available. And if the surgery surgery needs to be done within the six weeks, we use what is known as an intravenous tyrofabin, which is an intravenous antiplatelet, <coughs> half-life of two hours, so which is given. We just stop it four hours before surgery. So we replace with that. So we use it up to 72 hours. We can up to 72 hours. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the update, sir. Uh, there is one more question on the, this thing. Uh, Dr. Shashidhar, how much if I, how much your aspirin you are going to advise like that one question is coming on the screen actually. Yes, sir. How much 70, aspirin 70, you allow for surgery, sir? Yeah. 70, uh, 70 70 milligram. Most uh -huh. patients are on aspirin. Oh, yeah. so, uh, 70 <laughs> milligram aspirin. So we continue 75 milligram aspirin for the use. Uh, Dr. Shashidhar is the only for curiosity on your experience, on your expert opinion. 
and ideal anticoagulant in your experience mm, it's very difficult to pick up a single <laughs> anticoagulant because uh, uh, because i don't actually choose anticoagulant because it is either the cardiologist or a hematologist or a neurologist who will pick so if i were to go to a, our neurocenter a salford royal hospital where more most neurologic patients are the neurosurgeons and neurologists they tend to put patients on dabigatran because if you look at the trial figures dabigatran tend to cause less yeah. bleeding episodes human yeah. bleeding episodes are slightly less with dabigatran they tend to use that however you go to the cardiologist they tend to use rivaroxaban or abixaban so we see lot many patients on rivaroxaban abixaban uh rivaroxaban patients tend to bleed little bit more our our urologist don't like it so we recently started stopping rivaroxaban for 3 days if they are having deep pelvic surgeries yeah. like take cystectomy or prostatectomy we stopped it for 3 days rather than 2 days thank you thank you sir thank you very much i think uh, now the time is up I There's think. one more question, Gadada. Can I just answer that? What yes, is the, yes, go ahead, sir. What is the thinking regarding bridging therapy, sir? Yeah, uh, there's a major study which came in the Journal of Medicine about bridging patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. So this was a huge study. There were eight thousand patients in two different groups. Unfortunately, what they did was the study involved giving treatment dose of low molecular weight heparin for both the group of patients irrespective of uh, irrespective of their chart score so if you then look at patient with a very high risk of thrombosis they only made 27 patients in that group so we were very cautious in terms of adopting that so what we did was we carried on giving bridging therapy for any patient who had a chart score of 5 and 6 instead of giving treatment doses we started giving prophylaxis so we did the annual audit so which has been done over the last and we haven't actually seen any major strokes or major problems so with regard to bridging patient for atrial fibrillation there is very little value there is not much of a evidence for uh, bridging for patients who are on medication for atrial fibrillations uh, in terms of bridging the newer oral anticoagulant drugs it is very very weak there are some trials going on currently there is no clear evidence that we should bridge any patients on new oral anticoagulant agents uh, bridging therapy for antiplatelet agents very very limited the only time we use intravenous antiplatelet agents like tyrosine is patient was had a recent acute coronary syndrome a recent mi or a recent stroke where they have a stent put in and they need to have urgent cancer surgery then we use intravenous tyrosine uh having said so we have only used tyrosine in the last five we have used it for two patients that's a very small uh number of patients Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I request uh, President of ESA Karnataka, Dr. Manjunath, to give a thank you note. Oh, uh, thank you, Dr. Shukumar. So, sir, Shishidhar, sir, thank you very much, sir, for your excellent lecture on uh, on oral antico uh, anticoagulation and anesthesia. I hope as uh, many postgraduate students are also here, they will take home the message and. Uh, I do uh, so hope that you will going to continue your support from uh, UK. regarding our webinars for the subsequent uh, so on, uh, uh, webinars also and uh, i th- thank on behalf of the isc karnataka state branch i thank you immensely for the for your uh, lecture and you have taken away taken your precious time uh, uh, precious time and uh, spend uh, near, nearly 2 uh, and 2 uh, hours uh, in our webinar i thank on behalf of the isc karnataka thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you manjunath sir Ah, thank you thank you much. all thank you i thank one more thing sir i thank dr gangadhar sir and dr vijayanand and dr 
as an azam for uh, chairing this session and also dr gurudas sir and dr balabaskar so the so an academic chairpersons for uh, this uh, academic uh, session and also one more thing just i want to announce it on this uh, forum dr ranga is once again uh, dr our secretary also announced uh, earlier during the uh, opening remarks of this uh, now now for the closing remarks also just i want to announce it dr ganga dar sir is also a president elect and we are uh, as on um, uh, we, we from the we from the karnataka state uh, we are feel as on i request each and every one to support our candidature as uh, to dr ganga dar sir as a president elect and uh, dr vijayanand for as uh, on uh, an executive committee member of as uh, on uh, a national body so i request each and every one to support uh, both of us from i karnataka we want some representation in the uh, national level also so thank you very much and thank, uh, you, thank you. you thank you very much thank you sir thank, thank you thank you please support the dr gangadhar and dr vijayanath 100% yeah bal yeah, bal bas please want to say something to bal baskar sir bal baskar sir please no you have to open this open this yeah, yeah. Oh, no no now they allowed no, no i just said good night to everybody uh -huh. uh, they just removed my mute uh -huh. <laughs> thank you sir shikdar sir uh, the guest today uh, suresh left uh, long ago for uh, urgent thing and of course uh, as uh, dr manjunath has said um, the heat is on for the two candidates so in fact we should we could, we could get uh, support from england also <laughs> yes yes that's the uh, <laughs> last time not a voters shikdar sir last time whenever there were elections we were chasing our members who said we are gone abroad also we didn't leave them because they were still members of isa so they had the right to vote and they had a local <coughs> mobile number also so that is required for voting <laughs> thank, you, thank you baske <laughs> dr dr bal baske can i say something yes sir yes please uh, in fact last time when i was trying to uh, of course uh, in the national is uh, dr venkat giri yeah in uh, for the conference in liverpool but we were trying to activate our account we had a lot of difficulties in really? fact but so I, i just need to that help because if the important people i know are standing for the election i would like to vote 